Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hi, Dave. Welcome to the Quest Podcast. Hey, what's happening? Well, it's good to see you again. Um, so, I, you know, I realized the other day that I had not had you uh, as a guest on Quest, that you have been a guest on another podcast I produce called Danceology with uh, Edita Slavinska, and you did great on there, and we've known each other now for a while, and I and, thought... And, and, and the trip part about it is I thought we were friends. I, <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> you know, I get in these spurts of uh, booking guests, and I do them as like packages, and then I, you know, I might wait a month before I book more people, and I'm getting close. I've been saying this in every episode. I'm almost at the 100th episode of of Quest, so I've been wanting to like really ramp up like all the best guests. And I was like, well, who could I get for like these final ten? And I'm like, have I had Dave on? I've had dancers on, was ever have Dave on? And and uh, and I realized I hadn't. So welcome to quest after six seasons <laughs> oh my goodness normally when you're invited to a show and it's six season it's either like really ramping up like friends or it's about to crash and burn <laughs> well, well, well thank you for having me on <laughs> <laughs> so either the best is yet to come or this show's getting canceled in seven more episodes <laughs> hopefully not no. Oh, no. Oh, man. Well, Dave, you have a, a fascinating career, and um, you have been working in the world of dance for over 30 years, like an incredible amount of time. And to call you a legend in the hip hop world is an understatement, in my opinion. I think you might be a god of the hip hop world. And uh, we're going to talk about all this today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Can you imagine over 30 years? It, it's got to be over 30 years. 35 years you've been dancing, maybe? Yes, yeah, it's, it's over 30. And uh, you announcing that, it's, it's, it just, it, it hits. It tells, everyone how, 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 it tells everyone how old you are is what it does. <laughs> oh, I, I, don't, I don't mind. I, I, I'm going on 52, and I think I, I, I look great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're still moving, you know, that's the, that's the, the, the thing, right? It's like, yeah, you, that's what you want to be doing. Dance is one of those things you can do your whole life. If you take care of yourself, you know, unless you're a ballerina it keeps you younger. Yeah, for sure. For sure. This getting to over 30 years uh, in the dance world was no easy feat, I'm sure. And uh, we're going to get into some of this today, but particularly probably not an easy feat for you considering that you actually kind of you grew up in inner city LA you grew up in Compton a lot of people don't make it out of Compton so there was something uh you know something different for you I think can you tell the listeners a little bit about what that experience was like growing up in Compton in the 70s and 80s well for, for one I, I gotta say there's a there's a thing with the term making it out um it, it it's um it's realized after you try and, and just progress and try to do the next move and the, the next move and the next move after the next move and try to make things different than the way anybody that you know relatives uncles aunts, cousins have done before, ultimately you're just in a space that you just need to figure out who you are and beyond all means stay who you are and, and, and just keep progressing. Uh, getting out of Compton, I'm going to use the term getting out of, leaving Compton, I never wanted to look back. I just, 
I didn't want people to know I was from Compton. I thought that was just a, a stamp on me, you know, just. I, I think the general public has this kind of this pop culture depiction of Compton, Crenshaw, inner city LA, things they saw from like, uh, you know, the riots that happened there. How realistic is the pop culture interpretation of what went on uh, in that part of the city versus how it really was? Was it really a situation like you hear Chris Rock talking about where you, you know, you do everything on the floor because bullets are flying over your head? You know, is it is it that bad? Does everyone get into gangs? Is everyone into drugs? Like, there must be some semblance of a normal culture there, right? Well, it was that bad, yes. And it was, it was uh, very ignorant, I should say. And it was uh, a lot of people trying to prove themselves. And uh, it hindered everybody else just trying to get away from it, you know, and trying to trying to be stylish, trying to change the, the way that we dress so we can walk down the street. It was a lot of ignorance. And uh, I think it's way different now. Um, but it was absurd, I should say. <laughs> Were there safe zones for you? Like, was school the safe place to go to? Like, nothing. School was my safe zone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. School was the safe zone. And even there, everybody was try- just trying to, uh, to, to be gangster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> gangster is a forte for those who are not gangsters. If that makes sense. Interesting. Interesting. Because, uh, uh, gangsters are about money and life, life, livelihood and lifestyle. And everybody else is just trying to be on, trying to get on. And uh, I think, uh, I think people are realizing that today and shutting down these little peons that's just trying to be something. Sure. You know, just to prove themselves. Gotcha, gotcha, and the, and you know if the version of Dave Scott today didn't exist, what would the version of Dave Scott have been had he stayed there? Would you be alive today? Would you, would you be in prison? What do you think would have happened to you had you not had the success you've had? Well, I don't think that way because the Dave Scott of today is the Dave Scott that's forever gotcha. going to exist. There's, there's no, no other. <laughs> there's no. no other. There's no other fork timeline like in a Marvel movie. <laughs> not, 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 not at all. <laughs> well, certainly, dance was uh, what helped you move forward. What are your first memories of being interested in dance, and who were your influences? Uh, my, my first memories of, of dance was um, seeing breaking. You know. Uh, uh, my uncle put the VHS in, uh, and it, it was it was incredible, <laughs> you know, yeah, for sure. And, uh, and I felt like I can do everything that they can do on that 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 screen. And then my mom, she cleaned the house with Motown music. Every single I I can I can. Every single song I have, I can uh, sing the ad lib. Trust and believe. Wow. Trust. Y- me. You and I also got MTV when it was new. Oh yeah. So I mean, you know, both of because I'm two years older than you, and you know, we I but remember I, I, the I event had to watch it was. MTV at, at my friend's house because I did too. I did too yeah. because my my little cable provider didn't carry it, so I had to yeah. go to a friend of mine at a bigger <laughs> cable carrier. So I could watch. So like it, I didn't even get it for like the first two years. I, I did know, see I was at, uh, Ezekiel's house. He was like uh, the rich guy on the <laughs> block. <laughs> Seeing uh, the the music video format had to have influenced you as a dancer too, particularly when we got up toward you know Michael Jackson. I know you're a Michael Jackson fan, and that his you know his dance, his music was inspiring. What else do you remember from early MTV that influenced you? Well, it, it was of course Michael Jackson. Uh, from MTV that was a great influence, but it was um, the jazzy pop 
feel that was going on that was just amazing like uh, every female artist <laughs> that was out um, was great for me but it made me want to be better than what I saw sure so yeah, this. I just felt like guys were afraid of dancing, and I wasn't at all. What well, you know, really, this is in my opinion, break dancing was what made dance cool for guys. Like before that, you saw males in jazz or in tap or in. Um, ballet and it it wasn't a cool thing for a guy to do like it, when we grew up little boys played sports we played little league we played basketball and little girls danced like that's how it was right so it was always hard for the dance world to pull males into it um, because it just wasn't like the cool thing and your parents didn't want you to do that you know like your everyone's dad wants their kid to be a baseball player or a basketball player you know <laughs> like, that's sort of how our generation was but breakdancing made it cool for guys. In fact, it was almost exclusively for guys <laughs> at, in the beginning, yeah. you know? But I, my biggest advocate is my grandmother. <laughs> Granny, she said, you can do anything you want to do if you just put your mind to it. Mm -hmm. And the answer is always no until you ask. And it was, I, it, yeah. I, yeah, I believe that. That's for sure. It wasn't just the music that was really um, appealing to you and and breakdancing, but you like you like the whole culture of it because you were like into fashion and a lot of other things too when you were young. Would you say that you were oh, like a, a nerdy kid when you were younger? Were you one of the cool kids? And I, 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 I'm, I'm still a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a beard now. <laughs> you just have a beard. <laughs> no, no, the things that Tony Basil. Did uh, being from the genre where she she's from, and just overlapping everything that that she did for hip hop is incredible. My inspiration is Pop and P, and I'm, I'm still in touch with him today. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Wiggles, you, you don't understand. You know the for them to appreciate my work. And I'm a, an underling, <laughs> you know, uh, it feels good. But at the same time, we are all structured from one, one little seed that's planted. And R&B and hip hop is planted in my life, you know? So if I wasn't dancing, if I wasn't gonna be a dancer, choreographer, or creative, I, I will be creative in a different realm, in a sure. different atmosphere. Because right now I'm at my sister's house and I'm doing landscaping and I put a pole up. It's you sent me the pictures of that. 32 feet. I was pretty I'm, impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. um, you formed your own B-Boy crew. Yeah. So, yeah. What do you remember? What the name of your crew was? Did you have a name for it? Uh, yeah, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want to tell me, or did you really forget? <laughs> okay, let me tell you this. I'm, I'm gonna tell you my name in the crew. Are you ready? Yeah. Chaco Bliss. <laughs> 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 that's great that's great <laughs> wow um what happened to everyone else that was in the crew did you ever stay in touch with those people are they are they around well um uh i, I lost uh my best friend uh he uh his name was d Dedra gobert um he was in um, Boys in the Hood. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I lost, I lost him. 
Yeah. But I, I gained a family. Um, his uh, a girl that was at the time, uh, her first daughter, I'm, I'm the godfather. Yeah. So uh, we're family. We stay in touch. That's great. That's great. After, after, and you were what? How old were you when you started a b-boy? Were you like 13 or 14 or? Well, when, uh, when? When when you started your first b-boy crew, how old were you? Do you remember? Oh, yeah, like 14. Yeah, 14. When did you get your first big break? When did that when did that come about? Oh, not until I was uh in Utah. We were stayed at the club. And I I'm 6'4 and battled everyone. I had a lot on my mind <laughs> <laughs> and I got offered a job, uh, to finish a tour and I just left school and, and went on the tour. Who was the tour with? Do you, rem do you remember? Uh, it was, it was good. And, um, uh, it was different for me. It was, it was like, Everything that you would imagine if you're in a room by yourself trying to dance in Compton. So you it was it was amazing to the point to where I didn't want to do anything to mess it up, if that makes sense. I was like, oh, oh man, oh why are you in the bed at 8 30? I, I just want to be down there at Lobby Call. Right. There was only six dates left on that little tour, but I get it. You worked people as would a... Think, people would think I was, I was just like wilding out, but nah, I wasn't. <laughs> You uh, before you you really became a choreographer. You you did a lot of concert tours. You just as a dancer on stage. Who were some of the people that you danced for? You did. I know you danced for Janet Jackson, but tell me, tell the audience. Some no, of the other... I, I didn't. I, yeah, I. Woo. Uh, I didn't dance for a lot of people, only because I, I felt like I was oblong. <laughs> <laughs> I just <laughs> stood out. And when I got the job for um, Genuine, he he's six two, you know, if he stand up straight. But it it was cool because it fit. Everything else, I said no, I I I can't dance because I felt like I was I, I looked like a doofus. <laughs> but creatively. I felt like I can be better than that choreography. Not not to take away from, you know, Fatima and Swoop. These I love them. I I could have killed that choreography. And so I put myself in that that mode and, and I just wanted to create and dominate. Period. For sure. For sure. You wound up uh, working on some great dance movies yourself. Step up to the streets. You got <laughs> served, which is celebrating an anniversary this year, um, which I've said over and over again is one of my guilty pleasure movies. <laughs> I love to watch it. It's a little hard to see the hairstyles and the fashion in that, but I love watching You Got Served. Um, you wind up working in TV, so you think you can dance, dancing with the stars, different things. Let's... Let's dive into a little bit of this. What are your memories of Step Up 2? Okay, you want the stress part or just uh, the we, good part? Are you, the the, the two leads in that movie, parts? Brianna <laughs> Evigan and Robert Hoffman. And you work with Robert on on You Got Served as well, right? He was in yeah. both those movies. He was a he's a dancer. Was Brianna a dancer or did you have to like really teach her a lot? No, Brianna was a dancer. Uh, absolutely a dancer. She just, she, her nerves were bad. Like uh. she, she, she felt like everybody else around her was better than her. Mm. So she, you had, you had to like kind of bring it out of her. So I had to go to the sexy 
for her. So I'm like, okay, look, do this. Ah, give me, give me, you know, things like sure. that. And sure. she opened all the way up. Gotcha. All the way up. Yeah. What was that experience like? I mean, that was probably a fairly decent budget movie. And, and uh, I think just for the audience to hear, that was directed by John Chu. Might have been his first film. I can't remember. Yeah. Step up. Yeah. John Chu, though, went on to do Crazy Rich Asians. He's got the new Wicked movies <laughs> that are coming out. Like, this guy's went on to do, like, great stuff. What are your memories of working with John? Was he a easy director to work with? Okay. Let me tell you about John. For one, John got the film from his um, his uh, his video he did at USC, you know, while he was in school, and it blew everybody away. So it was his first film. John, you would think John was a dancer. That's how enthralled he was. He was like so in it, so part of it, and he wanted to know everything that you you wanted to get shot to the point where I, I i recorded every angle that i was doing uh the choreo for and and, and sent it to him he's like thank you i said i got more <laughs> he's like thank you I, i'm waiting i got more <laughs> <laughs> and he just accepted all of it and he was just ready and i think that's why the the film was so successful because he he understood movement to a point that it was ridiculous i love john some people say step up two is better than the first movie uh then step up period yeah <laughs> of course it is <laughs> Do you, would you think the the you know like we've seen a lot of like sequel movies and like every sequel tends to get worse um, but step up two is not really the case. Now step up three and four and however many more they've made since then, not so great, but, <laughs> and I wasn't really that much of a fan of the TV show. They did the TV. I was down in Atlanta working on films and they were making the TV show down there. And I was like, eh, you know, mm. wasn't really, I thought they really diluted the brand by that point. <laughs> but, uh, but two is great. Do you think the bar was held exceptionally high after the first movie? I mean, that was a Channing Tatum movie. Yeah, I um, I think Step Up 2 was a graduation of, of the Step Up films. Mm. Step Up 3D was monumental because it's the first dance film in 3D. In 3D, right. It does have yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Everything after that, I wasn't a part of. And mm. there's a reason. <laughs> yeah. yeah step up three although i didn't think step up three was as good as two i do i do think um i do i do think the 3d element of it is really appealing to me um let's talk about you got served you got served is a work of art in my opinion like incredible and it's celebrating is it is it the 20 year reunion of the of the movie this year yes doesn't yes, seem like that is. long ago. I, I don't like I, the time has flown by that well, fast. I, 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 I love you for that, John. Okay, because uh, we're we're only twenty. <laughs> That's right. We're young at heart. <laughs> That's what we are. You got served. I think is a work of art, and one of the things that I always find uh, most joyous in, in talking to you is that you know you really put together. I think literally a work of art on film. Um, you know, you can do without all of the dialogue, the acting, you could hit mute on a lot of the movie and just watch the dance and just be dazzled by this. And uh, I think it's just a, in, incredible. In fact, I think there's probably a generation of kids, maybe the, the, the Gen Z's or the alphas that think all oh, that's digital, <laughs> that that couldn't possibly be done in real life. <laughs> what are your memories of you got served? Well, um, let me say this. Um, don't don't take it for granted. Stress relieves me. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, so when I started, you know, uh, working on the film, 
I did a lot of the choreography in rehearsal and we had 30 days of rehearsal. But half of it was changed when it came time to shoot. So yeah, I, I developed an ulcer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it was not okay. But at the same time, I appreciated the 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 casting that I did. And that's what it's all about. And I took time to put everything together. And it's my first film. It's my first it was my first biggest thing, I should say. And so everything was meticulous, but there was a lot of gaps that things fell through. But because it was my first time, uh, the company picked it up for me. Clint Culpepper was like, I got your back. I got your back. And then when I, I showed them, I, it was like a show and prove. And I can never take away from that. And one of the things that um, I was getting ready to go on a uh, tour for B2K, who, like literally three days after we got off set, we went right to the forum and I'm like choreographing the tour. Clint Culpepper said, you know, you're about to change the world in dance. I said, you really think so? He said, yes. And they played the trailer on the big screen in our rehearsal every single person in there start crying. I didn't, no, I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that kind of um, made a difference in my life and in, in not only in dance and creativity. I started uh, trying to I'll do myself from you, not sir. And then I, I was told by someone that's great to me, um, Debbie Allen. She said, you, you're driving yourself crazy trying to beat the last thing that you've done. Just do different. And that's what I've been doing every single project, not trying to beat the last thing, just do something different. <clears throat> it's an interesting thing about film because it's really, it's really a painting that a lot of people have to paint on. It's never really entirely a solo thing. No. You have a lot of brushes on it and you know what? The movie could have everything great and the editor messes it up. The cinematographer, the lighting people, one bad actor, like, so many things can go wrong, which makes movies average or below average, in my opinion. Yeah. So, at least for You Got Served, nothing brought down the dance element of it, for sure. <laughs> that part was perfectly painted. <laughs> hey, hey, Todd, you know how hard I fought for to, to get every single track that I use in rehearsal? They're like, ah, it's gonna cost this much. I said, I, it has to be this. It has to be that. I fought for it. I mean, like, Fat Man Scoop. Come on. Every that was that movie was a vehicle. Blew, really blew these the, artists up. Yeah, for sure. And that movie was really a vehicle for B two K, right? Like that was yeah. always kind of created around them. Is, they were kind of being built up as a product and this was going to be like a big, a big deal for them. Yeah. But there were also a lot of other interesting people in that movie. Steve Harvey's in that movie. Lil Kim's in that movie. Wade Robson's in that movie. It was a really, a uh, really great cast. Yeah. <laughs> um, Teresa Espinosa is in that movie. And I have to say, I had the biggest crush on Teresa Espinosa. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. it. Didn't, she didn't even have to say a word, just show up. And those little crop top shirts and just, you know, she was just beautiful. She could dance. I was just like, oh, she my God. Janet, like, <laughs> that tour, oh, Velvet Rope, she killed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was great. I love love what she didn't get enough screen time in that movie, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was, so wanted to work with her so bad for so long. And was, she's just been one of those, you know, I, you have a dance education company, you're part of that. And it's just certain people that I've just orbited and never got to work with. And it was, she was one of those people that always just flew by and I could never, never get her. And I was like, man, you know, <laughs> would love to work with her. Anyways, you also worked in, uh, in TV. So you think you can dance, dancing with the stars, things like that. How, how is working in TV different than working on film? Is it really the deadlines more than anything, or, uh, or? Uh, it's harder? Hmm. Uh, okay, so so you think you can dance? You you're you're given three days, and you have five hours one day, uh, six hours the next, and then you have uh, uh, stage. Stage, you get to go over everything as much as you want for your three hours, but it's a lot of pressure and you can't show your pressure because the dancers are full of pressure. So um, it's, an, yeah, it's a huge aneurysm, um, but TV is a little different. Uh, Dancing with the Stars I had full time and was able to uh, come through with my entire concept. It's just, it depends on the show. Uh, you, uh, uh, so you think you can dance? It's, it's tremendously stressful, stressful. And the, the biggest triumph that I had is when um I, not not to take away from the one that was injured but one of the contestants was injured and they brought comfort back and they said i had comfort and twitch are you fucking kidding me <laughs> and uh it was amazing that's great. Um, that's, that's great. That's the biggest part. Is the pay better in film or TV? Huh? Is the pay better in film or TV? Uh, film. Yeah. It's just more consistent. And sure. Yeah. 35 years ago plus, um, you had you had a breakdancing crew. This week, as this episode comes out, breakdancing is in the Olympics. Would you have ever thought in a million years that we would be seeing breakdancing in the Olympics? Okay. I'm glad I can talk about this. Uh, I, I did a movie called Battle of the Year. And uh, I got all the best B-boys to my knowledge. And the movie didn't do so good, but I think uh, because the movie represented B-Boys from the USA going around and like the Olympics. And I think that helped with the B-Boys becoming uh, part of the Olympics. Trust and believe. Go look at Battle of the Year. I, uh, you heard it, folks. Go, go find that. <clears throat> um, I want to talk about this for a minute, how this is going to be done in the Olympics. I had to look up the rules before we, before we got on the, the interview today. So the way they're judging in the Olympics is there's a panel of nine judges who decide on five criteria, technique, vocabulary, execution, musicality, and originality. And they're using a digital slider to score the battles. So the slider will shift in real time toward the breaker who is outperforming the opposing dancer. Is this a fair judging system? Do you like this? Is this common? Do we see this in other places? Discuss that because I know you've judged before. Is this a fair way to judge? No, it's not common, but um, every judging uh, statistic is, is, is like major. They, 
they have some that's okay how much of uh old school do they put in it how much new school do they put in it how much um how many tricks do they put in it and it's all categorized you have to judge on that so i think the way that they're judging i think it's fair only because it's um strategically right you know because uh, you can just get out there and do a bunch of tricks and and why so you have to have a reason for your why so uh i i don't oppose it it's going to be interesting to see i think that as we're recording this i think breakdancing has started and uh and i'm very fascinated to see um if the americans get the gold because you know we sort of originated this whole thing <laughs> well i i'd like to talk to the legend uh much respect crazy legs um because it was straight street yeah and it was a point to where he opposed you know it being mainstream because mm -hmm. it was straight street and then he got on board in a big way i would just love to you know hear him talk about it yeah that would be a great interview that would be yeah. a great interview to get those That'd legends uh together uh, you know i lean a little bit more rock steady crew than your electric boogaloos rock but you know steady. you know uh. where this is east west all over again <laughs> 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 we shouldn't be friends man <laughs> no, no no yes we are okay <laughs> I want to talk about you've mentioned in the in the interview that you're six four. I'm six two. Has your height ever hurt you? I know you mentioned, you know, not looking right on stage with people as a dancer and being too tall uh next next to people. I'm not sure that matters anymore. Uh when I see stuff like and Taylor Swift's not a perfect example of this, but Taylor Swift has this ethnically ambiguous, gender ambiguous everybody type world of dancers on stage like every she shows that everybody of any race any uh, identity whatsoever can be on her stage <clears throat> so she's got people she's a tall girl she's got dancers taller than her men taller than her on stage like i think you see that lady gaga you see that a lot yeah. so maybe it's not so much as an importance today as it was well, it, it, it was it was bad back in the day back then yeah yeah. But I'm curious, uh, aside from like how you looked on stage next to a performer, has your body ever just been too big to do things you've wanted to perform? Have you ever had that kind of problem? Oh no, my 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 body has never been too too big. I have never crossed the yellow line. Okay, I've <laughs> I've been uh, always uh, uh, in shape, maybe not in health. But at the same time, no, I, no, everything has been cool. But I, I, I have problems with my height because I was always taller than everybody. And mm -hmm. when I, I was asked for my first job to come just, you know, dance out of the blue, I was like almost three inches taller than everybody. So that kind of helped me to catapult myself to just chore choreograph because I felt like an outsider. And plus I want to change everything anyway. So, uh, yeah, but nowadays people are, are like six, five out here, 257 pounds mm. <laughs> like going off, but it wasn't like that back in the day. Everybody yeah. was shorter. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I think it's interesting where people hold their height. And when I say that, I don't mean like people that are 6'2 or above, but even a person who's 5'8", their length may be in the legs, it may be in their torso. People hold length in different places, and I feel like that there's not enough 
professionals talking to the kids about their bodies in terms of you know what their capabilities will be in ballet uh, certainly no, I, I i actually do just because i'm tall mm -hmm. so when i teach I, I i tell everybody with limbs i'm like you have limbs listen you have to work harder than everybody that's short and i tell everybody that's short you have to work harder than everybody that's tall because you have to reach mm -hmm. and taller. You have to get to that level. So everybody has a challenge. You got to meet that challenge. And I had to meet that challenge and I'm here today. That's why I'm teaching you guys. I'm here today because I had to meet that challenge. I, I, can, I can go from up to down in 0 0.85 seconds you know quicker than someone that's short and they have to get back up as yeah. fast as i get back up yeah so and it and it's it's crazy in this because you know in the dance world it's always really been master apprentice there's no book you buy at the store that says these are things <laughs> that you want to be conscious of you know i've been to so many ballet tap jazz studios you know the kind all over the country with trophies on the walls and you know their competitions they do and all that and there's so many little chubby dancers because they just don't even know <laughs> they're drinking sodas and crap in the studio and i'm like come on man someone's kind of like <laughs> no. get to the parents or something and tell me and all in to watch your bodies developed and what you know like there is an optimum height for a ballerina you know because ballerinas professional ballerinas are on point so that's going to bring more height to them so they want to be at a certain range of five six five seven five eight you don't really yeah. really don't want to be and i remember editor telling me that i was a little too tall to be a great ballroom dancer as much as i love ballroom that six two is a little tall for it. That like five ten is the sweet spot for what no, they can that, do. That, that's that's because you have to find your partner. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. you if you're six two, good luck. I know. <laughs> find, find I know your, your girl. You know. And I was like, I would think that the length of my legs and my arms would be great for ballroom. And she's like, yeah, not not exactly, you know. So I, I think the physicality of, of of dance is something we really don't hear much about. So to hear you talk about being 6'4 and, you know, some of the aesthetic problems versus real world problems, uh, you know, is nice to hear. I do, I do want to get a little philosophical for a moment, though. I'm curious. Um, can a good dancer be a bad choreographer or a bad dancer be a good choreographer have you seen those scenarios unfold or is there a certain magical recipe that has to happen to be a great choreographer well um i think um you can be a good dancer and a great choreographer you can also be uh a bad dancer and a great choreographer only because your choreography is your creativity and it's outside of your actual motion. You're outside looking in so you can create better than your body can move. Uh, I feel like, uh, some dancers try to be good choreographers, but they overthink because they're good dancers, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's too many moves without, too, without enough feels, uh, only because you dance great. Um, I think uh, sometimes uh, all choreographers need to take a step back and uh, get the emotion, get the, get the stride, get the, the feel, and know the entire platform because you're just doing that. That's just one part of one song. You got 13 other songs to go. Create a story. 
also being a choreographer is being a teacher. And some people just don't have the words to be good teachers. I would think yeah. maybe that would maybe factor into it too, that, you know. Yeah. I, 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 I get kind of irritated that everybody that dances just wants to teach a class. There's a thing to teaching. I'm not saying I'm, I'm like uh, the Messiah of teaching, but there are teachers that I admire, you know, like Brian Friedman, like, you know, uh, like Mandy Moore, uh, like Rhapsody, you know, you're saying something. And I'm, I really admire these people that I've just, I just said, you're saying something not just giving you steps, giving you moves, telling you when you're gonna trip and fall, if you trip and fall, do this. So it's a, it's a method to teaching, a, a, a really strong method to teaching. Jamal Sims. One of my favorites. Teaches. He barely teaches. When he teaches, he'll tell you exactly What's what? Gil Dogla, killer. Lorianne Gibson, she would give you too much information. <laughs> That's how good she teaches. So it's not just steps. You gotta you gotta let them leave with something that makes sense. Lately, uh, can, kind of continuing in this philosophical aspect of the, this portion of the interview. Just recently, within the last uh, few days, there's been a lot of um, activity on social media um, about people teaching choreographies that aren't theirs and not giving proper credit. And uh, some of the big um, steps on Broadway, Broadway Dance Center, Millennium, the dance magazines have all made social media comments about how much they think poorly of this. And uh, this started with Sarah Juliet Shaw. And Sarah posted a video of a teacher in England teaching choreography that was hers. Just outright lifted teaching the class. So this has been a, a big source of discussion. <clears throat> and I want to chime in on this for a moment because I think I might come in on the other side of the coin than maybe you will. Is how you feel about that. Um, how proper credit should be given with that versus the human body and its movement and should that be copyrighted? Like, you know, well, well, I, I, I is there like, a uh, thin line there? I feel like there are no new moves, period. Everything is recreated and it's, it's all about your adjustment, your creativity, and how you bring it out. Uh, there's a lot of things that have been done that are redone. I, I've had things stolen from me that was done in a football game, done in a Super Bowl, uh, literally done in a music video, like the entire choreography. And the only thing you can do is fight the person that did you know now we have the choreographer's guild which is uh coming along strong but there's only two people that own their choreography and that's michael jackson who's the other <laughs> you know the other. <laughs> I don't know the other. I didn't know anybody owned their own choreography, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I get like if it's a movie, they're sort of the the master you know, copyright of the entire production, right? Well, like Well, Michael got a lot of his moves from the other person that owns their choreography. Hmm. That's Fawcett and no one else does. So I'm not too big on people using your, your choreography. Uh, a, a lot of people feel like, oh, that's, that's a blessing. It's a, it's a tribute. 
it's a tribute to something no. No, 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 no. Not unless it's an attribute to something. Then you keep using it. You know? So if someone steals your choreography and they put it in a music video, but they lay no claim to they came up with the choreography, is that okay? Oh no. Just give give credit to where credit is due. And that's good okay. enough. Yeah. That's good enough. Or is compensation? I, uh, sometimes conversation is not necessary. You just, you know, give the credit. Tip the hat to who did it. Yeah, because later on, all of a sudden, there's an Emmy going to this person, and right, and they didn't do it. <laughs> right, I get it. I get it. <laughs> Well, that's certainly been something that's uh, that's come up here in the last few weeks, and I wanted to get your take on it. But I want to move toward a rumor I heard about you. I heard a rumor that you snuck on the set of a house party film. Is that true? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Statute of limitations is over. You can't be arrested for trespassing now. <laughs> I'm assuming that you're in the house party, right? Yes. Yes, I was. Yeah. So we're going to look around. We're going to find a guy that's six foot four in the background somewhere. I'm going to screen grab this and it's going to be associated with the Instagram post I make for this interview. Am I going to find you in the film? Yes. <laughs> what did you, uh, what did you think of kid and play? Were you kid and play fan? Yeah. No, I'm absolute fan. Because I mean, some was, people were DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, some people were Kid and Play. Like they were sort of I, like I was, I was Jazzy Jeff, Fresh Prince, all, all of that. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. yeah. Kid and Play were great. They were great. That was a, that was a fun, such a fun film. And then and then I ended up doing a, a house party film with Chris Stokes. What? Which number one was that? Four. <laughs> Four. Four. <laughs> There's a reboot now of it, isn't there? Isn't it on Max? And they, they just recently do another one? I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. I've been around. <laughs> um, so you and I were lucky um, because we grew up, I think, with the best dance movies ever. Like us growing up, uh, being 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I mean, there was like five or six years worth of just incredible dance movies. And I don't think any other generation has had that. Like certainly I think with the millennials, no. there was definitely a resurgence of dance movies because you were part of those. <clears throat> but in the 80s, we had the best. And I'm just going to write, and I want you to add to this list as I sort of just off the top of my head talk about them. But I remember my earliest memories, Saturday Night Fever, huge influence to me huge movie um yeah. urban cowboy you know travolta yeah. did he did grease he did saturday night fever he did urban cowboy all next to each other and urban cowboy although not so much a dance movie had all that country western dance in it yes that he was part of mm -hmm. so three entirely different types of movies that really kind of cemented his fame early on not counting like the breaking movies break into electric boogaloo <laughs> you know like we had oh. a foot foot loose came out then you and i share you know a what? favorite like oh, yeah. Ty, like uh i it was like a reward to get to a friend's house for them to play the tape because i didn't have the tape mm. you know what i mean i didn't have the vhs to watch breaking I'm like oh gosh and people like you all, all of the people that you see on TV, they can come to your studio, come like and, and just dance with you. We didn't have that. <laughs> so we had the VHS. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was, it was crazy. That was like the golden ticket. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also um, flash dance. I, I talk about flash dance a lot. I mean, so much artwork, like <clears throat> if I was going to compare you got served to another movie, I would closely say it's more related to Flashdance than anything because Flashdance had so many incredibly creative dance scenes, not counting one of my all-time favorites where the girls are walking down the street and they see Ken Swift from the Rocksteady crew and there's people, like there's a moonwalk going on there. Off. 
it, it was just, it was just like that movie was such a work of art in so many ways. And, uh, and I, I, that's, I don't have a fondness and I don't know if you really catch the connection I'm trying to make, but like you created these segments that were just freaking art in, in, in you got served. And I, I feel like that feels a lot like flash dance to me. Flash dance was um, my little boy fantasy. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was very attracted to her. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Beals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Jennifer yeah. Beals. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I think people will look back on Jennifer Beals in Hollywood. She was really one of the first ethnically ambiguous actresses. You didn't know what she was. She appealed to so many people because of that. And like, you're like, uh, is she Latin? Is she mixed? Is mm -hmm. she, yeah, you know. You don't know. Oh. You don't know what she is. And that way she appealed to everyone. And I'll tell you who I think actually maybe is one step beyond her is Jessica Alba, who, of course, was in Honey, great dance movie. Um, but you don't know what she is like she, yeah. and, and she, it's weird because she's played everything. She played an Asian girl in a movie. She was a blonde yeah. white girl in, in fantastic four. She's played Latina. She's played half yeah. black. She's played everything. Yeah. But hot in all of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. She <laughs> hits everyone's fantasies. Um, <laughs> Also, we also share, still on 80s movies here, we share a common favorite that I joke about with everybody now that I know this, that we both like the movie Xanadu. <laughs> I brought this up the other day and someone said, what's Xanadu? I've never heard of that. I'm like, ah. <laughs> No, the, the, the thing about it is like the, my creativity to, today comes from everything that I've seen back in the day. And unfortunately, it's to be better than what I've seen back in the day. You get what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when I saw, to be honest with you, Breaking 2, Electric Boogaloo, mm -hmm. I thought it was the worst thing that they could create. <laughs> and I, I, my goal in life was to make a movie better than that. And I... I feel like I did, <laughs> you know? I remember Electric, it's been so long since I've seen part two. Uh, oh my God, it pissed me it, off. I'm it's like, bad. It is bad. But I, I seem to recall, I remembered like maybe one scene in that that was like really cool. Was did that have like the broom or the mop dance? Yeah, in when it? he was uh, going across the, the roof. Yeah. That's the only thing I remember that had that's, any significance. That's the best thing. That was they it. tried to to uh, match him with the broom outside the store. Yeah. You know, in right. One. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah well, but I think, you know, I just, and I've just touched on part of these. Like I watched a movie on Tubi the other day that I don't think I'd ever seen from the eighties. I'm like, how did I miss an eighties movie? And, and it was like, these kids were like dancing on BMX bikes. And I was like, what the heck is this? How did I like, oh, miss... which one, which one? Uh... I don't, I can't remember the name of it now. I just came in in the middle of it and I'm like, they're doing, Dan they're dancing on BMX bikes. This is nuts. And I don't think it was rad. The rad was that BMX no, bike rad. movie. It wasn't yeah, that. Rad, they did that. Did they do it in that? Yes. Then maybe that's what it was. It might have been rad. Yeah, I rad came they, in they, on. They, they, uh, it was BMX because that was that was my thing. Because yeah, yeah, they were they were dancing on the BMX bikes, and I was like, what? How did I miss this? You know. <clears throat> But oh, we just, man. I think we just touched on a few of these, but I, I'm telling you, I don't think there's any other generation outside of Gen X that had so many movies that were either musical films or dance films um, like we got. No, the, the, the thing uh, of it is, it's, it's, it's like we had the, the dance movies that was the late 80s and 90s, but ultimately the musicals, were super big, you know, uh, going in like through the eighties when, uh, disco started to die. It was, uh, cause you couldn't tell me anything about Greece. That's my favorite 
movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ever. I will be the only black guy with a t-shirt on with cigarettes rolled up in my, my, my uh, collar. I think it's a great case study uh, to look at Greece and Greece 2. That you have this great choreography in Greece 1 by Pat Patricia Birch. <clears throat> and yeah. then you let her direct the second movie. <laughs> <laughs> and why maybe we shouldn't let choreographers direct films. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Hell no. <laughs> Don't let her bring us down. <laughs> <laughs> Ruin the whole franchise for us. <laughs> it really never came back after that. <laughs> oh, no. Hell no. <laughs> But yeah, that well, you know, that movie just uh, touched on so much for people, really. The nostalgia. I often yeah. talk about nostalgia and how it works for. I wrote a script for a movie set in 1984. This has been like one of the three scripts that I've got from my days left from Hollywood, way, way, way back. Three scripts that I never got to that I always wanted to get to. I had one that was a western, one that was in like an 80s musical film and another that was like a really dramatic film. And each of them had their hazards on why I didn't produce them or make these movies. The Western, obviously, was a period piece. And it was also sort of a horror film. It was a werewolf in the Old West type film. So it was a difficult one. It was sort of, you know, odd in the genres it would fit into. So it was just a problematic one to make. Um, and also, like, vampires and werewolves, they have their time in the sun. Like, vampire movies are hot and then they're not for a long time so you had to kind of fit in when a werewolf movie could happen the 80s the 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 80s musical film started as just an 80s inspired comedy you know one of those just filthy 80s comedies and it evolved to be a musical which i really liked but i feel like 80s nostalgia is gone now because i think nostalgia works in 20 30 year increments and it's sort of, we're past it now. Like kids today, they are into 90s nostalgia now. So I feel like I kind of missed the boat on that. And what was great about Greece was it hit that point where you could, you know, you could be in 1958 or 1959 or 60 or whatever Greece and Greece 2 were because the nostalgia was suited for the era. It would be harder to make a movie set in that time frame and make it work today. And I think we saw that with Jam with Jamal Sims working on the Pink Ladies show for Peacock. Um, yeah. They just, you know, I tell you, Jamal might have done the best work of his career on that show, which you can't even see now because Peacock pulled it off of the network and doesn't make it available anywhere because the rights were so expensive to it and they lost so much money on it. But Jamal... Well well, go ahead. well the, the the thing of it is is recreating the action you get what i mean if you if you can have a period piece but it has to be on the level of what dance is now mm -hmm. you know not not the level of the period you you're trying to portray you have to you have to pick it up a few notches you mm -hmm. know what i mean yeah so you you gotta you gotta have like uh, a little i'm gonna use this word a little more pizzazz than back in the day and and that's what the artists of today have but everybody's not a creator like that yeah you get what yeah. i mean yeah mm-hmm I feel like what hurt the, the Pink Lady show like, was... Like La La Land. You know right. What I'm saying? And they didn't give my girl Mandy her props. She did that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was and her she, masterpiece. She, she has these top actors moving jazzy, you know? So it's, it's like, sorry to cut you off, but it, yeah, it's like that, you know? Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating because it is you know like I said before paintbrushes on on a canvas, but uh, but yeah that uh, Jamal had so many really intricate dance scenes, but I felt like it was just the kids today didn't understand the time period, because yeah. if you remember when we were young, like there was certainly a fascination with the old west in the eighties because it's only a hundred years out from that, but then you're less interested in what went on in the nineteen tens and the nineteen forties. You know, or the 19th, like, like you, there's periods of time where you definitely see where there's interest and then periods where there's, I'm not interested in those decades. And I think with it, what we did was we had a reboot show 
that was that the kids didn't get and it couldn't yeah. find its audience and it's unfortunate because people will now now not get to see jamal's potentially his best choreography he's ever done and they let him direct a lot of those episodes so just cinematically what was done with some of these the camera movements and the the action that had to be happening on set things going on off camera that you're about to to yeah. pan to is was just a, a miracle of of uh, it's, it's, it's it's like you it, it has to be quicker like quicker like handling it uh, okay cut to this cut to that you know and you kind of miss some of the story of the movement mm -hmm. is what i should say and i'm big on movement being the story period yeah. point blank and um back in the day everything took a little longer to get to and then when they got to it, it was swift, quick, going, musical, done, you know? And I love the musical platform. And you just have to know how to choreograph and direct that, yeah. you know? And I think you, Todd, knowing just your conversation, you will know what to shoot. Oh, boost, boom, ha, go, cut to this, boom, boom, boom. You know, like you would know what that four seconds would look like for four minutes to somebody else. You know what yeah. I mean? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, Dave, I appreciate you engaging in this uh, very interesting interview and a trip down memory lane and. Uh, and all that good stuff. Uh, always, it's always fun to get on the phone with you. When we have our just our private phone calls, we talk sometimes for hours. <laughs> yeah, uh, we end up going in, in like, "Oh my goodness, you said Kwame?" <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, you know it's funny because I, I hate. I never want to be. I'm always a forward thinking person, right? Like I, I always tend to just, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, think back in the past, like good, bad, whatever it was, it's done. I just want to move forward. I think you always have to have a vision of what's next. You know, that's what makes life exciting, yeah. but I can't help but reflect on, and, and maybe I'm being greedy about this. Maybe every generation says this. I think Gen X, man, we had the best stuff. <clears throat> I think oh, we had goodness, the yeah. best culture, the best music. We got to go through so many diverse changes and all of that and live through all of this and consume what the new generations, what the millennials and the Gen Z's and the alphas like and to get to see their art. But I kind of feel bad that they didn't get to see the stuff we got to see. I know. I, I, it, yeah. And it's a, it's a few things like kids not knowing how to write in cursive. Uh, mm. What the hell is that? And also I saw this thing on TikTok back in the day when you blocked someone, it was the phone off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, oh boy. I mean, I love technology and I love everything that's 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 happening right now, but at the same time the the pattern that we had to go through everything strengthened who we are today, I should say. For sure. Absolutely. Um yeah. You know, I I say this a lot. I write this in my books, but I say nostalgia is memory minus anxiety because if you wait hold on yep nostalgia is memory minus the anxiety of the moment right i'm right now, so now you can look back on stuff and you remember oh my gosh making that or doing this or whatever like you you know if you were back in the day doing it it was stressful and it made you anxious and it was disruptive to you but we when time passes, all that anxiety goes along, goes away. And that's what I feel the de definition of nostalgia is. It's the memory of an event minus the anxiety of the event. The event. So it's my little equation for it. And that's how I feel about some of this stuff, you know, is well, that you need, you need to patent that because I, I wrote it down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what I feel it is. I do have one, one more question for you before we wrap the okay. podcast up. I heard this rumor and I want you to, to say if there's any truth to it all. I heard a rumor that you might have an autobiography coming out next year. Is there any truth to that? Um, 
yeah, it, it's in the form of a book. Uh, through uh, through my publishing no company, a <laughs> guy no name Todd Fisher. <laughs> We're working on it, folks. We're working on it. This is a loose <laughs> announcement, you know, like. We're we're yeah, a long I'm, way away um, from this coming I'm, out, but I'm actually uh, giving up the ghost, and uh, it's it's not easy as it's hard, but Todd, you you're you're making it a little bit more convenient for me to uh, release uh, some of the things that are trapped inside of me, and I think it's gonna better my life. Well, you you say what releasing the ghost is that what you called it? Yeah, yeah. I call it introducing the goat because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no better tale of dedication and perseverance than what you've done, literally from your childhood to where you're at today. And it's not all an easy ride, and that's what people need to read about: is that look, if you can overcome, keep moving forward, keep you know trying to find the creativity, which drains sometimes, like you are an embodiment of that. And people are going to see in this book uh, that you're one of the greatest of all time. Oh. <laughs> you're the LeBron of the hip hop world. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you even got his beard right now. <laughs> no, he wants his beard. He wants it. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, so, you know, we've been talking about this a lot uh, off camera, but, you know, we're saying it here in this podcast for, uh, for perpetuity that we're working on a book. So unless the world well, ends. I, <laughs> just, just for everybody viewing, telling your story or talking about yourself is not an easy thing. And uh, to uh, actually... Uh, let yourself go and uh, open yourself to even someone else to actually tell the story that you want to, to tell is a process in itself. And uh, I, I give it up to Todd for being there for me and um, understanding that it's not easy and, uh, and accepting the phone calls week by week. <laughs> <laughs> And, and talking the shit that we talk. <laughs> it's a long, slow process with something like this because it's not a short career. You know, it's no. not. It's a, it's a lot of years worth of stuff to go through because, um, you know, where you think there's not a story, some little thing that happened in, you know, 1994, I see as maybe something bigger. So we have to dissect it. And we're going I, year I, by year I, right I, now, folks. We are. And, and there's things that I'm like, Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, when we talk, <laughs> especially when we send each other like one-hit wonders of the '90s on text, and I'm like, "You remember this? <laughs> you remember knocking boots? <laughs> I know. You remember you Juicy remember got PM you crazy?" <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But you know what I like about it? Why I do it is because what it does is it triggers memories, right? And you get the nostalgia from it. Because at the time, that might have been like the popular song on the radio when you were going through terrible heartbreak. But now you yeah. like hear the song in a different way. So what it does is it triggers all the memories around that time. That's what's great about music. It's sort of autobiographical for people. Everyone remembers that song that was the theme to their prom or the, for the song that was on the radio when they kissed a girl for the first time or mm -hmm. the song they walked down the aisle to when they got married. Or their first, like, There are so many songs that are so pivotal that were speaking to you when you were going through an emotional time in your life. And that's, that's the, that's the thing that I, 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 I trademarked this phrase. We are what music looks like because at the time we create a moment with our movement from the sound and, and you just, you just going, you may forget it, years pass and as soon as the song comes up you go oh, you remember that moment that moment i was at the kitchen sink you know mm -hmm. <laughs> i turned around and i was like oh and my mom was dancing and i hugged her you know you 
we are what music looks like, you know? And yeah. And when you spend, when you're in your 20s and you're spending a lot of time on choreography, you know, just to go out and and, and do it a, a, a dance at a frat party or whatever, and it's to, you decide you're going to go out and you're going to dance to Bobby Brown's Every Little Step, and you've got some moves you put together to impress everyone, you never forget that stuff. It's all just sort of merged together. You still, you can be 55 years old and still remember those moves you did. You might not physically be able to do them if your body's shot, but you still remember it, right? You you can one time and then leave it alone. You can't do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, Dave, it's been a pleasure. How can people find you out there on social media and the interwebs? Well, uh, all of my platforms are the official Dave Scott and uh yeah website and everything uh, youtube channel everything all right don't go to the unofficial dave scott we don't know where that'll take you but yeah no, no. probably <laughs> a porn site I didn't <laughs> probably, probably so <laughs> anyways <laughs> official dave scott you can get him anywhere with that and dave yeah uh, it's been a pleasure let's talk soon and uh, thanks for coming out and doing this today Thank you for having me, man. Take care. Metacortex Publishing hopes that you've enjoyed this presentation. Please take a moment to listen to some other podcast offerings from Metacortex Publishing. The Danceology Podcast interviews the great masters of dance, the working professionals starring in today's most exciting shows, and the rising stars ready to amp up the craft. I'm your host, Edita Slavinska from Dancing with the Stars. Join me as I dive into the world of dance, uncovering unique stories and the fascinating personalities of industry professionals on Danceology. Hi, I'm Father Daniel DePlantis, a Catholic priest, martial artist, and host of the Karate Priest Podcast. Have you ever wondered what the church teaches about different topics? Are you a martial arts enthusiast or just someone who wants to learn more about martial arts? I'd like to invite you to join me and many guests on my podcast as we cover topics of faith, everyday living, and martial arts on the Karate Priest Podcast. The No Earthly Explanation podcast investigates the things that are unexplainable. Hosted by world-renowned investigative researcher Donald R. Schmidt and scientist Ellie Ringo, follow them as they look for evidence for things that have no earthly explanation. Available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Every year, tennis players from around the world compete for excellence, triumphing against all odds to emerge the champions. I'm your host, Maddie Harrison. Join me as I get up close and personal with these dynamic individuals and find out what it takes to go for greatness. Let's go beyond the match. Cult Following is a podcast that studies the personalities and common traits of cult leaders and their followers. Get the real story behind these infamous and oftentimes tragic cults from a new perspective through exhaustive research, and from interviews with people that were there. Available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Hi everybody, I'm Amber Rose, the Religious Hippie, and I host the podcast A Catholic's Perspective. Join me every two weeks as I release episodes targeted towards helping young Catholics navigate their ever-changing secular world while staying strong in their faith. Whether you are a Catholic or not, all are welcome here. So if this is something that interests you, feel free to tune in. You can find A Catholic's Perspective on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I hope to see you there. Bye! Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and Anthony Smith and is distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. 
please be sure to visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.